Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, an aside is a quick commercial about the power of these events like Aero Podium that we're all at. Um, a few weeks ago, I attended the Miami Beach Aircraft Investment Seminar. Um, you know, we come to these events to learn, to network, and to build collaborative business opportunities. And later today, we're going to discuss a, a business opportunity that is very exciting for my business, very exciting, I think, for the industry. Um, and it all came out of an Aero Podium event in Miami Beach, so it, it's great to be here, great to be back, and Gus, thank you for facilitating this. My name is Justin Sullivan. I own an integrated suite of companies. Um, our, our primary brand is Ajax Jets. We're a floating fleet part 135 air carrier focused on Dassault Falcon Jets. Um, the, the aircraft that we operate are classic, so they're pre-2000, um, and I'll discuss some of the, the advantages and, and opportunities that that business model creates. In addition to our air carrier, we own a 145 repair station in Buffalo, New York, private jet maintenance that specializes in maintaining these classic airframes, mostly Dassault and Bombardier products. I'm also a YouTuber. I, I have a, a YouTube channel called Your Friend with Jets. Got about 25 videos up right now. And you know, quietly, one subscriber at a time, building an audience of dreamers, industry insiders, <coughs> aircraft owners, potential owners, charter customers. So please like and subscribe. The title of my presentation is How Private Jets Make Money in 2023. And I'm first going to highlight a couple articles from the, the very recent last couple weeks that would, would um, propose a, a contrarian business model. So the first is, a, is an article from Financial Times. Uh, it was written about VistaJet, private jet disruptor, the debt fuel descent of Thomas Floor's VistaJet. Floor said his business was highly profitable on an earnings before EBITDA, interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization basis, and that his net losses were a consequence of conservative accounting of non-cash items, such as depreciation. Deferred revenue sales have supported cash flows. At the end of 2022, customers had paid up $831 million in upfront monies for hours yet to be flown, Yet, at the time of that writing, VistaJet had only $134 million cash in the bank. The combination of debt, net losses, and short-term liabilities <coughs> prompted Auditor EY to warn its opinion in the 2022 accounts that a material uncertainty exists that may cast significant doubt on the group's ability to continue as a going concern. Um, the focus on EBITDA is, is a very 2021 business metric to look at if you're trying to run a private EV, private airline for profit. Looking into a Forbes article written last month, the wheels off it wheels up, possibly affecting others in the private aviation industry. Over the past decade, the company steadily increased its, oper its revenues to an impressive 1.58 billion in 2022 but has not yet turned the corner on losses, which totaled a staggering $555 million last year. While year-over-year -year revenues increased during the first quarter, so did net losses. Meanwhile, the company had announced that it had issued an equipment financing note, an aggregate principal of $270 million via an enhanced equipment trust certificate loan structure. The equipment notes are secured by a primary lien on the company-owned aircraft, they have a maturity of seven years and a coupon of 12 percent. About $259 million of net proceeds were anticipated from those notes. And after mortgaging those notes, or those planes, Wheels Up built a cash war chest of $585 million by the end of 2022, shrinking to $363 million just 90 days later. <clears throat> They're losing about $2 million a day. The company has approximately $1 billion in deferred revenue and $363 million in the bank. 
that math is not math. You might say that Wheels Up is having a rough go of it, and the reason for that is because in today's climate of increasing interest rates, slowing charter and member demand, the metrics that they're chasing, EBITDA, revenue, and member growth, really couldn't be any more meaningless. The title of my presentation is How Private Jets Make Money in 2023, because it's very different than how private jets have, um, have made money in the past, because we're entering a different, mark, different operating environment. So based on the foregoing, I'd like to talk about three things that I would not do. I would not capitalize the purchase of expensive late model jets with junk bonds in a high interest rate environment. I would not fund operating expenses in a low margin business using prepaid customer deposits. And I would not roll up disparate charter operations and fund those acquisitions with debt. You see, what's happened in the charter market in the last 18 months is not only has demand post-COVID spiked precipitously, it's come down a bit in 2023, but the amount of consolidation, the supply chain of our industry has changed dramatically because of those two aforementioned companies, ExoJet and VistaJet. Together, those companies acquired Mountain Aviation, Red Wing Aviation, Jet Edge, Apollo Jet, Air Hamburg, um, uh, uh, several others that I'm, I'm drawing a blank on right now. And in so doing, this, through this roll-up strategy, they've encountered a lot of operational hiccups and operational pressure, similar to back in 2008, 2009, when the parent company of Sentient Jet did the same thing by rolling up about a dozen Part 135 air carriers. And unfortunately, that business model failed um, in, in pretty prolific fashion. And I'm not gonna say anything about, about what's, what's about to happen uh, with these companies, but that's not what I would do. I would focus on organic growth. So we operate a fleet of classic planes. Uh, the oldest executive business jet in our fleet is a Falcon 50 manufactured in 1981. Ronald Reagan's first term. But if you were to look at the interior of that plane, the avionics of that plane, and look at it from the outside, it would stand it up versus a, a late model super mid-sized jet. You really wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It's that leverage point of, of purchasing and operating fully depreciated executive business jets and focusing on owner outcomes and having an asset light model that works. We focus on the operational excellence of one platform, Dassault Falcon Jets. Falcon 50s and Falcon 900s, super mid-sized and heavy jets. It's the same pilot rating for both planes, a lot of parts and maintenance commonalities, and that gives us and our charter customers a great deal of, um, of flexibility and confidence in, in the platform knowing what they're going to get. So when we're quoting our fleet of planes across the country and across the world, we're not necessarily quoting tail number specific, we're quoting a Falcon 50 or a Falcon 900, not knowing which particular tail number that's going to be. Our business model is asset light. So every aircraft that's in our program is owned by a different high net worth individual or company. Um, and there's no access entitlements. So I think where, where these companies have really found themselves in trouble is with the, this deferred revenue, which creates a great deal of operational pressure with, with call-out entitlements. Um, for example, wheels up, 24 hours notice, there's an operational entitlement, their members can call out an airplane. But what if an airplane happens to be way out of position? They're gonna be, that, that company is gonna, is gonna eat that, that deadhead and lose money on, on that trip. In our case, the only parties or who can can a plane. Or they, can, or they can outsource the plane yeah. and, and pay through the nose. Yeah. Um, in, in, our, in our business model, the only people who can call out an aircraft are the owners of the planes. 
Um, they obviously have a contractual entitlement to be able to fly on their planes. But other than that, if a member or a charter customer or a wholesale customer, uh, two thirds of our business comes from the wholesale channel, um, requests a trip that does not fit neatly into our schedule, we're playing small ball with these planes on our schedule and, and where they need to be. Um, if it's a retail customer, we'll just broker out another solution. And if it's a wholesale customer, we will gracefully decline um, that trip. So we're not creating that operational pressure or we're, we're not taking it on. We're, we're not taking on the financial pressure of, of financing these assets. We're focused on managing, operating, and maintaining and flying one platform of aircraft. And the whole capital model of a fully depreciated jet, to give you a perspective, a late model Challenger 350, it's about a $30 million, you know, high 20s, low $30 million asset compared to a Falcon 50 recently refurbished from built in the 80s or 90s, about a two to $3 million asset. So in my world, operating aircraft for fun and profit, I would rather have 10 Falcon 50s generating 10x the cash flows of that one Challenger 350. I'm a car guy um, and I, I like to to use this analogy, if you think of a, if you look at a 2023 Mercedes G-Wagon, about a $300,000 vehicle, if it's an AMG, and the, the owner of this vehicle is buying it for, for his own reasons. He wants the curb appeal of that vehicle, he, um, he wants a new, new car, he wants to, to feel a certain way, but he's gonna treat it very differently than if he had bought a 2010 Mercedes G-Wagon even if they look almost identical. The 2023 G-Wagon, he's probably not letting his daughter drive that car to prom. <laughs> um, and if he's got a, a 500 mile round trip, he's probably not putting those miles on that vehicle because he doesn't want to take that depreciation hit. But if he's got a 2010 G-Wagon, which looks the same, drives the same, he's gonna treat it very differently. He doesn't mind if his daughter takes this $40,000, $50,000 vehicle to prom. He doesn't mind putting 500 miles in a day or over a weekend on it because somebody else has taken that depreciation hit. Same thing with executive business jets. You have a $65 million 2023 Falcon 7X. Your chances are you're probably not gonna put that plane into the charter fleet because you're buying that for your own very specific reasons and you don't want anybody you don't know on, on that plane, and you don't want to put the hours on that plane because you don't want to take an accelerated depreciation hit on a $65 million asset because every hour that that plane flies, it's depreciating. Here's a 1989 Falcon 900B that we recently refurbished. Absolutely beautiful, about a $600,000 interior. And this jet, all done is in today's market, six, seven million compared to 60 to 70 million for this, this brand new Falcon 7X. It's the exact same cabin cross section, right? Now. Roughly, this, you know, it's a, the 7X is a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. It's got a few more toys in, in the cockpit. But from, from, a, cat, from a, a customer perspective, they, they both have high speed Wi Fi, they both have a tall, um, very comfortable, very modern. Um, brand new cabin. I mean, the 7X is a little longer, but like the, the height, you know, width, yeah. almost, I, I, almost I, I don't know, but probably the same. I think it's the same, yeah. I wish I, I, wish I had a 7X to, to be able to tell you. <laughs> Bring the, me the measuring tape. <laughs> but the mentality and the psychology for going into this, this 1989 $7 million plane is totally different. This is a plane that's going to print money in today's charter market because it's beautiful, it's got high-speed Wi-Fi, it's available, and the more hours that you put on it of profitable utilization, you're not going to have a significant or a meaningful impact on the depreciation. If this plane flies 1,000 hours in a year, it's not necessarily going to depreciate much more, whereas if that 7X flies 1,000 hours in a year, it's gonna see a substantial depreciation hit. 2023 Citation Latitude, $30 million super mid-sized jet. 
1992 Falcon 50, brand new cabin, a $3 million jet. Same principle applies. What, what charter customers care about is, is this. They want to fly in a beautiful cabin. They want to have pilots who greet them by name and treat them great. They want to have a, a solid end-to-end -end booking experience. They want to have high-speed internet on the plane. And they want value. Especially in 2023, charter customers want value. And I, I don't have to tell anybody in this room that the richer the guy, the richer the company, the more value conscious they tend to be. So the charter throughput in today's market for these absolutely stunning executive business jets from the 80s and 90s is exactly the same as the charter throughput for a late model jet. Um, what you find is that companies like ours who have owners that want to put those hours on the planes and aren't quite as discriminatory about the trips that we put compared to a late model plane, we're putting more revenue on a machine on an annual basis than a late model operator. The cost of capital is, is really um, self-evident. Two to three million dollars for one of our planes compared to 20 to 30 million dollars for a comparable super mid or, you know, no matter how you slice it, 10 to 15 percent of the cost of, of, a, of a comparable brand new plane. And in today's rising interest rate environment, it's even more um, important because almost everybody is financing these late model aircraft with rising interest rates. However, um, not to be blase about it, but two to three million dollars for, for many, many investors is pocket money to get into a executive business jet. It's gonna be a great lifestyle business and cash flow tool. And for somebody who's in the heavy jet market to be able to come out of pocket for six million dollars for a heavy jet is very doable and these investors can avoid the, the, the credit environment that we're in. Depreciation, another big component of this EBITDA um, metric. Somebody else has taken this depreciation hit on, on these aircraft. And with newer aircraft, the calculus for depreciation is all about age of aircraft, comp sales, number of hours, and to a lesser extent, the do list. With classic airframes, the calculus is really all about the do list. Where is this airplane on its heavy check schedule, hours remaining until engine overhaul, how is the interior, how is its, its compliance with airworthiness directives and service bulletins. If you have a 1989 Falcon 50 that has 12,000 hours on it, if that, and, and a do list of X, if that same 1989 Falcon 50 had 14,800 hours in that same do list, it's probably worth exactly the same in today's market. So the more hours that you can pack onto these classic airframes, hours of profitable utilization, um, the better the outcome you're going to have as an owner. And maintenance. Um, maintenance is a, if you have that, that brand new 2023 Mercedes G-Wagon or a brand new Bentley or Rolls Royce, you're probably not going to take that vehicle anywhere but the factory service center for every piece of, of maintenance that's due. And you're probably not going to do anything but use factory OEM parts to do it. Um, if you have a 2010 Mercedes, um, you bought that vehicle for a reason, probably because you're value-oriented and you don't want to bring it to the Mercedes dealership, but you have a, a trusted relationship with a reputable service center who maybe isn't going to buy factory OEM parts and they're going to maintain it to the manufacturer's spec. They're going to do a great job, but they're not charging you $295 an hour for a mechanic to work on your vehicle. Um, you're able to, to, to employ different leverage points 
on the maintenance of these air, of these classic airframes. And I'll give you one more example. Um, engine programs. If you have a late model plane, you wouldn't dream of taking that plane off of an engine program for the very factor that it would kill your depreciation, it would greatly accelerate the depreciation, kill your residual value of your plane. And also, those engine shop visits can cost millions of dollars. The Falcon 50s that we operate are built with TFE 731 engines. There were over 200,000 of these engines manufactured by Honeywell in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. They were the, the engine on 15 different makes and models of aircraft, from the Lear 31 up to the Falcon 50. The because it's, it, it's an engine for smaller airplanes, Lear 31, Lear 35, West Wind, Astra, Jet Stars, <coughs> the shop visits for these engines is a fraction of a shop visit for a newer engine. And a data point of that is that we recently did three, um, two MPIs and one CZI, so, so three major 2100 hour events on three engines. And the total cost out the door for those three engines was approximately $550,000. That metrics out to under $90 per engine per hour compared to over $400 per hour for Honeywell MSP, almost $500 an hour in 2023 for Honeywell MSP. In a high utilization model where we're putting 1,000 hours a year on an airframe, that one factor is saving over $700,000 a year and in this business, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned. So the, the, the owner of that plane is cash flowing 700 grand more on a two to $3 million investment just for that engine factor. And he's not taking a depreciation hit because of it. And, you know, from, from mechanic labor to pilot labor, it's the, as I mentioned earlier, it's the same pilot rating for a Falcon 50 versus a Falcon 900, um, and you compare what, we're, what we pay a captain for one of our 900s compared to, you know, uh, the global 7500, probably about half, pay, pay our captains about half, you know, the, what, what these rated pilots are making for, um, for the, the latest and greatest sexy plane. Um, maintenance is cheaper, labor is cheaper, Pilot training costs about half, so simulator training, a flight safety or CAE for, for a DESO 5900, about half of a Challenger 300. Everywhere you go, you're finding increased financial leverage and operational flexibility with this platform. This is a solution for owners who go into this with a, a different mentality. Um, the owner, the, the traditional owner who, who buys a plane for his own use and enjoyment, he's putting it in, a, in an FBO or in a hangar near him, and it's, it's there for, for that owner at his beck and call. Um, that's not what we do. We, we focus on, on owners who are looking for a silent partner, but that silent partner is charter. And they're very happy when their aircraft is out in the charter market generating frothy returns and it comes back to that owner when they want to use it. So for that owner who's focused on outcomes, the outcome of getting himself and his family and his business associates where they want to be, when they want to be there in absolute safety, comfort, and style without breaking the bank, without paying that 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars a month in fixed overhead before they fly an hour that's the owner that we want to talk to about their flying and about um, how this, what, what I'm talking about, can really be transformative um, to them, their family, and their business. Um, and in addition, we're, we're, uh, we're raising a $25 million fund to, to buy these classic airframes because what we're going to hear about more today is, is growth in the industry. These OEMs who are constantly, um, you know, who have supply chains and, and um, uh, 
um, production schedules that are scheduled 10 years out and the new jets are coming and most of the, the, the customers of these new jets are not first time buyers. They're second, third, fourth time buyers. So what happens to their old airframes? We'd like to bring them to our fleet. We'd like to capitalize that. And we think there's gonna be some really exciting buying opportunities in the next two or three years. Happy to answer any questions. So with the current labor market, right? Pilots, maintenance, technicians, uh, with what they're paying, how's your turnover rate? How, I mean, with the other airlines or other competitors out there that are willing to pay more? And, uh, yeah, what, we, we what quality pilots. of life are you giving them pilots? Like, are they, are they On average, over a year. But we lose pilots to the airlines. Uh, it's tough to compete with some of these signing bonuses. Um, most of our pilots are older. Um, we, we haven't had great luck with that model of hiring young pilots that come in and want to rack up a lot of hours. Because to your point, they rack up those hours and, and they're off to Southwest. Um, older pilots tend to stick around. And there's, there's a pretty strong network of Dasso, Falcon, jet pilots. So our, our strongest recruiting tool are our pilots who are, see, who are meeting other pilots and FBOs, and we have beautiful equipment, our pilots are well compensated, and um, you know, they like flying the Falcon. It would be tougher if we were operating Lear jets, right, because not, not quite as sexy a plane to fly, but Falcon 50, Falcon 900 is a very fun airplane to fly. Um, it's kind of like flying a fighter jet, and these guys, like it, but labor's tough. Um, with, with, with mechanics, we've been fortunate, we're, we're in a highly localized market in Buffalo, New York. Um, Bombardier is, is, is close, but our guys are all older. And there's a lot of gray hair. Um, they're, they're very adept in, in working on these classic airframes. So you find that, that the OEM service centers, you bring a bring Bombardier, a Challenger 601 or a 604, they don't know what to do with it because their young technicians don't know those systems. So we see a lot of spillover of those jobs. Um, and the same with Dassault Falcon Jet. You, know, you bring a Falcon 50 to a to Dassault Falcon Jet, uh, back up the brakes truck, and, and they'll tell you that. All right, guys. I, I, I've got a question. So uh, we've actually done a lot of trips with you guys um, over the last three years. So it's been, it's been great. Your team's uh, awesome at communication and just been a really great experience. But um, what is the relationship you guys have with Chicago Jet Crew? Uh, they, they used we used to lease planes to them before we had our own 135. Got it. So okay. Like, and then uh, you know, in terms of in terms of uh, like owner cash flow or whatever, you guys have any of the owner? And are there any of the owners that are actually? Um, creating profit, or are these are all just offsets to their own uh, travel needs or whatever? It depends how much the owner flies. Yeah. So if okay. the owner is a, is a low utilization, this model very comfortably supports 75 hours, 75 occupied hours yeah. of owner flying per year. And if the owner's flying less than that, they're getting checks. If they're flying more than that, they're writing checks, but they're not writing very big checks. Got it. Okay. Got another question. With your pulse on the industry in this specific market, uh, what have you heard about Jet? I know you talked about this and Jet and stuff, or do you follow what's going on with Jet? Uh, with that 135 operator? The, the Honda Jet operator? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've read the articles. Um, I, I think they're done. And there's there's two big Honda Jet operators who are, are trying to, or very actively trying to poach yeah, all, of, all of those planes. Yeah. Um, don't don't have much else to say about it though. All right, guys. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. <laughs>